Some of you might remember, especially if you're like my age, there was a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, there was this commercial that was on. And it was like, it was a series of people that were giving testimonies about what they dreamed about. And their testimonies were, I, I, I'm dreaming about being a drug addict. I'm dreaming about being a criminal. I'm dreaming about being, you know, this person. I'm dreaming about being a failure. I'm dream, dreaming about being a loser. And they had all of these different people, and then it stopped, and it said, no one ever dreams about that. No one ever dreams about that, and it was about helping, helping people in some sort of way. I don't even remember why. But, but isn't it true that when you were a kid, you had this unfiltered vision of a future that was limitless? It's like you could do anything when you were a kid. I remember thinking when I was a kid that I was gonna be in the big leagues. I was gonna play professional baseball, and there was nothing that can stop me. I remember getting in my living room with my wiffle bat, and I remember watching games. No one else was in the house, and I'm watching games, and I'm in my living room, and I'm trying to time the pitch. I'm trying to time the pitch of the, of the game I'm watching, and I'm swinging at strikes, or I'm taking if it's a ball. And I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna make it to the big leagues. Like, easy, no problem. Zero limitations on me. I remember running around when I was a kid and I would put on a cape, which was actually a towel that was safety pinned around my neck. And I would get on the couch and I would jump off the couch because I could fly. And then I would run down the street and I swear if there was a bad guy, I would have just, I felt like I could beat people up. I felt like I could take down the bad guys, that nothing was impossible. I remember talking to my boys who were right here when they were younger. And I remember saying, like, trying to train them, like, hey, what would you do if someone came up to you and they tried to grab you and take you, like, in a crowd? And they'd be like, Dad, I would punch him in the, you know what, in the cash and prizes, the family jewels, or whatever they called it. And I would be, no, you're supposed to say stranger danger and scream and spaz out, but they thought they could do it. They thought they could take them out. They had dreams that were un, unfiltered. If you're a young lady, you might have dreamed about like winning a pageant, like my wife did. <laughs> I'm not sure if she dreamed about it, but she won a pageant. <laughs> now everybody knows. You're so beautiful, babe. Why wouldn't you win a pageant? I'd vote for you. Or maybe, you, maybe you, as a girl, you like soccer and you, you dream of winning a, a World Cup or, or maybe you would just dream of, of having a marriage that was romantic and forever. I know my daughter is seven and I asked her just yesterday what she wanted to be. She said, I'm gonna be an artist. And I fully believe it and she fully believes that she can be an artist and that nothing can stop her because she has a desire and she loves to do art. But something happens, huh, when we start to grow up. And we start to experience maybe some losses. We start to realize that where we came from might not match where we wanna go. That the world around us begins to beat us up a bit with negativity thinking, I can't believe you're believing for that. You? No one in our family's ever even gone to college and you're believing for that? And we start to see some failures. Maybe we get cut from a team or maybe our own parents get a divorce, or maybe we see our friends, families falling apart, and all of a sudden the dreams that we thought were inev inevitable to become true become impossible. And so discouragement sets in. And discouragement comes with limits. We start to compare our future vision with our current or past experience. And now our future shrinks to who we think we are based on what we see and have experienced, not who God says we are. And then we beat our own selves up for making mistakes. And we get more and more discouraged. And just because a mistake may have caused you pain or delay, that doesn't mean it was a big sin or that you should condemn yourself. But the devil tries to take, make a mistake and compare it to a sin and make you feel bad and put shame and guilt on you. But every mistake is not a sin. And every sin is not a mistake, unfortunately. You don't wanna live there. But Jesus, this might sound crazy, Jesus wasn't perfect because he never made a mistake. 
Jesus was perfect because he never sinned. But the devil tries to confuse mistakes and sins, and so now we are repenting for a mistake when what we should be doing is asking God for wisdom to make better choices in the future. And I'm not even saying that Jesus ever made a mistake. I don't know. I mean, he was a carpenter. Maybe he put a nail in the wrong place one time. I'm not sure, maybe he went five for five every time he played a baseball game in high school. I don't know about you, but uh, whenever I get the Ikea like uh, drawers or cabinets or something, I'll put the whole thing together and then there's the one side that's supposed to be shiny on the outside, not matted. So now I gotta take the whole thing apart, put it back so the outside is shiny. I'm not sure if Jesus ever did that. Maybe he, was per maybe he never made any mistakes. Maybe he never made any mistakes, but I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to decrease his divinity. I'm trying to increase your validity. I think we, I think we sometimes we're, we're beating ourselves up for making a mistake when we had a pure motive and a pure heart and we're condemning ourselves and letting the devil come in and discourage us when actually God's up in heaven cheering you on saying, at least you went for it. At least you tried. It's all good if you make a mistake. Don't let the devil put shame and guilt on you for something that's not even a sin. But discouragement just keeps coming and coming and coming. And so I think we sometimes we can confuse mistakes and, and sin. And I think we can also confuse disqualification with unqualification. Pastor Jurgen talks about this at our Emerge Night. The devil wants to disqualify you, but God wants to unqualify you. If you are disqualified, you're out of the game. But if you're unqualified, you're actually in a perfect position to win the game. Unqualification is just a spirit of humility. It's a posture of humility. So you don't have to disqualify yourself. You can just understand that you might be unqualified, and that's okay. In Little League, my boys play Little League, and Little League is crazy. If you have a kid that played Little League, parents are nuts, right? Right? My kids at seven and eight years old, we were in a game and there was almost a, a stands clearing brawl, not a bench clearing brawl, a stands clearing brawl because the umpire kept making mistakes. <laughs> I was okay with it because there were mistakes in my favor, in our team's favor. But these guys almost came unglued. But, it, but, but Little League is serious business. It's serious business. And there's something called All-Stars that's even more crazy. It's very strict. There's all these rules because it's international and they, they want to make sure that everybody's playing on the same playing field and all this kind of stuff. So you can play the whole season. You can earn yourself on the all-star team, but you're still unqualified to play until they see your birth certificate. Because your birth certificate tells you how old you are, where you're from, and all that kind of stuff. And it basically confirms the fact that you can play on the all-star team. So you can make the team and still be unqualified until you get your birth certificate. And that qualifies you to be able to play in All-Stars. The difference be between being unqualified and qualified in this life is your birth certificate. When you get born in this life, you get a birth certificate. It tells you who you are, where you were, you know, like how old you are, what your name is, all that kind of stuff. Well, when you get born again into the family of God, you get a birth certificate and his name is the Holy Spirit and he comes to live on the inside of you and you go from being unqualified to qualified to do the things that God has called you to do. He is your receipt that says you are now qualified to play this game we call life. You get born again, he is the receipt and it positions you now to overcome. First John 5, 4 says for whatever is born of God, overcomes the world. All you need is your birth certificate and it'll cause you to be an overcomer. And it gives you access to an inheritance that Jesus died for on the cross and left for you on the earth. Colossians 1.12 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. You don't qualify yourself, God qualifies you. And if he needs to qualify you, that means you, you were initially unqualified. But he has 
qualified you, even if you don't think you're worthy, even if your past doesn't match the future vision that you have for yourself, the Bible says he has qualified you. And so if you can just understand that and come to God in a posture of humility, knowing that you're unqualified, he can qualify you. And isn't that like the core of Christianity? The core of Christianity says, God, I can't do this by myself. I need a savior. Can you come into my life and help me? Can you come into my life and qualify me? Can you come into my life? Because with you, all things are now possible. That's the essence of Christianity. So basically, your unqualification qualifies you. Your unqualification qualifies you. Matthew 3, 13 to 15, Jesus is coming to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet in the Bible, the Bible says, says, this is the Lamb of God, the one that takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is coming to him at the Jordan, which we were at, to get baptized. And so John says, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by John. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you are baptizing me? But Jesus answered him and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And so because John the Baptist, I believe, came with a posture of humility saying, Lord, I'm not even worthy. Then he became worthy. I'm not even qualified to baptize you. Then he became qualified. And because he became qualified, he actually qualified Jesus, in a sense, to do his ministry. Because Jesus submitted to John the Baptist. He said, I'm unqualified to do my ministry. I'm gonna submit to John the Baptist's ministry, a, rep a baptism for repenting of sins, but Jesus never sinned. But he submitted, he gets baptized, and because he got baptized, the heavens opened and qualified him for his ministry when the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove and remained on him. Even Jesus, who was God walking on the earth, was unqualified until he, was unqualified until the Holy Spirit came and qualified him for his ministry. But the reason that happened is because he had a humble spirit. The Bible says he was so humble, he came to serve. He even served his creation. That's how humble Jesus was. I want to show you a movie clip about a guy who felt unworthy. He felt un qualified, but he ended up saving the world. The title of my message tonight is The Surface and the Sea. The Surface and the Sea. See, Aquaman was born of two different worlds. His dad was a lighthouse keeper, a human being on the surface, but his mom was a queen in the sea. In the, in the movie, the, the underworld or the sea is launching a war against the surface. And because Aquaman was born of both worlds, he was a little bit conflicted. He was raised on the surface, but he had the power of the sea. And he wasn't connected to any of them, so he felt unfit. He felt unworthy. He didn't think he could lead. He didn't think he could do what God called him to do or what his mom said he was going to do, and that was to unite these two worlds. He was the only one that can do it. He was so unique in how he was made. His mom said, because of you are of these two worlds, your destiny was to unite the two worlds. She was prophesying over him as a little kid. And she wanted him to embrace his uniqueness, but he wanted to reject it. He wanted to hide it. He thought he was a, an outcast. He didn't fit in. He thought he was some kind of weird hybrid. And so he kept rejecting his call. But thank God Aquaman had Mira, played by Amber Heard. She said, you think you're unworthy to lead because you're of two different worlds, but that is exactly why you are worthy. So the very thing that unqualified him, he thought actually qualified him. It was being of both worlds that made him unique to save the world. And I don't know your specific purpose in this life, but I do know this, that you are called to operate in two different worlds. You are called to unite two different worlds, the surface and the sea, or the natural and the supernatural. That is how you were created. And the greatest way to overcome discouragement, fear, depression, is to embrace the power of the sea, or to embrace the power of the spirit, and embrace your destiny that God has called you to. I know you grew up on the surface, but I'm telling you, unless you get comfortable with the sea, you're not gonna be able to overcome. 
You're not gonna be able to do what God has called you to do. And it wasn't until Aquaman accepted himself for who he was and embraced the sea that he positioned himself to change the world. In the beginning, God made Adam and Eve, but before he made Adam and Eve, he made the whole world, he made the heavens and the earth, he made the moon, the sun, the stars, he made the sky, he made the sea, he put fish in the sea, he made the land, he put beasts on the land, he made creeping things, and every day he said it was good. But it wasn't until he made man that he said it was very good. You and I are God's highest creation. And so before man was created, every creeping thing, animal or fish, they only had a voice in one world. They only had a voice in one world, in one realm. They only had influence in one realm. Even angels who were created before man, before, before the earth, before the heavens, they only had influence and a voice in one world, the spirit world. And they can't influence the physical world unless we give them access to. And so there, before man, it was the, the angels and the demons who had a voice in the spirit, and it was the, the beasts and the, uh, and the fish and the, and, the, and the birds that had a voice or had the ability to operate on the earth. But when man was created, he was created uniquely. He had the ability to tend and to keep, to eat food, to pet the animals. He had the ability to operate in the natural but communicate with the spiritual. He had the ability to commune and relate to heaven, a spiritual thing, but he was given dominion over the earth, a natural thing. But the only reason he had dominion over the natural thing was because he could operate in the spiritual thing, because it was a spiritual thing that created the natural thing, and the creator always have dominion and authority over his creation. And so you and I are are called to operate in these two different worlds. Psalm 8, verse 5 says, yet you made human beings, man, You made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. And you gave them charge over everything that you made, putting all things under their authority. And so God created the world and didn't put you in charge of it. You and I are called to operate in both of these worlds. You're the only one with the ability to do this. It's crazy. We're called to live in reality, but walk by faith. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. The stuff that we do on earth affects heaven. When you bring your tithe, heaven opens up. When you pray for somebody, the power of heaven follows you up. Heaven and earth, heaven and earth, united in in, in us and through us. But then the devil tried to mess everything up. God made everything, put you in charge of it, and then the devil tried to sneak in, make Adam and Eve sin and take away the authority on the earth, which he did for a season, but thank God he had a redemption plan. And his redemption plan was to reunite heaven and earth, the surface and the sea. And he did it by sending heaven to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus teaches us how to unite these two worlds. I've shared this revelation before, but you didn't know I got it from Aquaman. Jesus teaches us how to unite these two worlds. He says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. He said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, he wants you and I to unite earth to heaven. Because you can unite earth to a different world. The evil world, you have a choice. But you and I are called to operate in this life and in that one. And so if something on the earth doesn't line up with heaven, you're called to bring heaven to earth. And so if you're called to bring heaven to earth and recognize those things which aren't of heaven, then you have to know what heaven is like. And we've talked about this. Heaven, there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no lack, there's no sadness, there's no discouragement, there's no limits. And so if you see something on earth that's not like that, because as it is in heaven, it should be on earth then you unite those two worlds. It's also important to know who, how, who God is because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are you in this life. So it's important to know as it is in heaven and as he is in heaven so you can unite these two worlds to match heaven. It's also, it's also important Uh, to know that you have the ability to operate in the surface and the sea or the natural and the supernatural, 
but you're not just an average person in both of those worlds. You're actually at the top of the food chain in both of those worlds. The Bible calls us a royal priesthood. It calls us kings and priests. It says he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So not only are you able to operate in two different worlds, you're at the top of the food chain in both worlds. A king has ultimate dominion and authority on the earth and a priest has ultimate dominion in the spirit. So what does that mean? That means there ain't no devil above your level. And that means that you are called to have dominion over the earth and subdue the earth. You are at the very top of the food chain in both worlds. In both worlds. But just because you're at the very top of the food chain, just because you've been given authority over the spirit realm and on the earth, doesn't mean that you're gonna rule and reign in this life. You gotta step into it. You gotta believe it. You gotta step out in faith. Thank God that uh, Aquaman had Mira. She's kind of like the Holy Ghost in that movie. And she says, the only way to stop this war is for you to take your rightful place as king. So unless we take our rightful place as king, we're gonna lose the battle. We're gonna lose the war. If we don't realize who we are and who God has made us and what he's given to us, and we keep disqualifying ourselves or thinking that we're still unqualified to do what he's called us to do, we're gonna lose. And then Aquaman says, trust me, I am no king. What I like about that is he didn't disqualify himself. Disqualifying yourself means, no, I, I'm not gonna do it. He just said, I'm no king. He didn't say, I'm not gonna do it. He just unqualified himself. But if you can come into a place of unqualification, God can qualify you. God can qualify you. There's a story in the Bible about a guy named Gideon that's found in Judges 6. I love this story. Gideon, uh, the, the, the Israelites are being attacked by the Midianites. And they're coming in and they're, they're, they're stealing from them. They're, they're taking their harvest. And so Gideon goes into a wine press and he starts threshing wheat. He's in this little space and he's threshing wheat because he's scared, he's discouraged, and he's reduced his life to a wine press because he can no longer see a future for himself. And so I love that Jesus or that God or that an angel of the Lord, the Bible says, comes to him at his low point, at his place of discouragement and unqualification to qualify him. Judges 6 verse 12 says, uh, an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. He's in a wine press, he's scared, he's discouraged, he's depressed. And immediately, after the angel of the Lord who sits with God in heaven says that, Gideon starts, launches into this complaint and he starts vomiting all over this angel. <laughs> oh my Lord, if the Lord was with us and all this happened to us and where are the miracles of our fathers told us about? Did the Lord not bring us out of Egypt but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites? I just love the next verse. It says, then the Lord turned to him. In other words, while he was complaining, the Lord was like, I can't hear you. I only hear faith. So then the Lord turns to him, completely ignoring his complaint. And he says, go in this might of yours. It didn't even distract him from his mission and for what he saw Gideon to be, not who Gideon saw himself to be, he says, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? When I was praying this week, because even pastors and leaders go through discouragement. And I was praying and I was discouraged. I'm not gonna lie, I was discouraged this week. And I was like, God, I need a word from heaven to keep me going, to get me through this discouragement. I was starting to unqualify and disqualify myself. And this is what I heard God say. He said, trust the call. Have I not sent you Gideon? I know you're in a wine press. I know there's stuff happening. I know there's people ravaging all of your goods, but have I not sent you? Trust the call, Gideon. I'm with you, even in the wine press. I'm with you. So he said to the angel of the Lord, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. So again, Gideon doesn't disqualify himself. He just unqualifies himself. 
He says, I'm not leaving, God. I just, like, how can I do it? I'm the least. I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And this story is crazy. He goes down, he, he, he wins this battle of tens of thousands of soldiers with 300 men, but really it was just him. Really it was just him. So he accepts this call. Gideon accepts this call. And I love the next uh, part, verse, verse 19 starts to talk about it. It starts to say, okay, God, but if I'm gonna do this, don't leave yet. I wanna go prepare an offering. I wanna go prepare a sacrifice, a goat and unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord says, okay, I'll wait for you to get back. When you bring it back, put it on this rock. Put it on this altar. And so Gideon comes back with the goat and the unleavened bread and the angel of the Lord stretches out his staff and touches the meat and immediately the fire falls on the sacrifice. The fire falls on the offering and consumes it. It's interesting that the fire doesn't fall on the altar but it falls on the sacrifice. I think sometimes we use the altar as a crutch and we come to the altar and we have an encounter with God, which, is, which happens. We encounter God on the altar, but then we go back to living the same life that we live. And then we come back to the altar and we say, God, it's still happening, I'm still addicted, I'm still looking at those pictures, I'm still behaving badly. And we come back to the altar and, and we're wanting a magic pill and then we encounter God again. But remember, it's two worlds that we operate in. We gotta operate in this world, we can, we can encounter God, but the fire isn't gonna fall until you sacrifice something. Maybe you gotta bring an offering, maybe you gotta do a fast, maybe you gotta do a pray, uh, uh, maybe you gotta pray, maybe you gotta stop behaving the way you're behaving, maybe you gotta change your language. If you want the fire to fall, you gotta make a sacrifice. Maybe you gotta bring an offering, maybe it's money. You're wondering why you're stuck and you keep encountering God, it's because you haven't made a sacrifice. He makes a sacrifice and then verse 34 says, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and enabled him to win this impossible battle. I love it, have I not sent you? Trust in the call. Make a sacrifice and watch the fire and the spirit of God come on you to empower you to do what you were called to do. That's what Aquaman did. Check out this final scene. So I love Aquaman. Because he goes down into the sea. And that ugly monster says, you're not worthy to be here. You're a disgrace. And he says, I'm not here because I'm worthy. He says, I'm just here because I'm answering the call. The call that my mom gave me when I was just a, a little boy to unite these two worlds and be, to become the one true king. And he doesn't just look to himself, but he lets the gods of the sea determine if he is worthy. So he grabs the trident, which is the power of the sea and it releases for the very first time because I believe he came in with a, with a spirit of unqualification and he let the gods determine his qualification. So then he takes that, that trident and he becomes the one true king. And what I didn't show you is that the, after, after that scene, he goes up to the surface and he fights his brother, King Orem, who was the king that was bringing the war against the surface. And he fights him on top of a ship. And he comes to the end and he has his trident and he's about to slam it through his throat. And then he stops and he shows him mercy. And his brother who was on his knee says, don't show me mercy, that's not how we do things. And he says, I'm not one of you. I'm gonna show you mercy. And so he leaves and he unites those two worlds and he saves the world. But it was only because he finally embraced his call. He, became, he came with a spirit of unqualification and humility, but then he embraced the power of the sea. You and I will only complete our call if we understand the power 
of the Holy Spirit and the dominion that we've been given on this earth. Just like Aquaman was called to change his world, we're called to change our world. And until we realize that we are unique and that we can operate in both of these worlds and unite these two worlds, we're never gonna complete what God called us to complete. Thank you for tuning in, church. We hope this message reached your heart and was one in season for you. We're eager to hear how God is moving in your world. If you have a praise report or prayer request, send us an email at online at c3sandiego.com to share. Also, to partner with us financially so we can reach people all over the world, go to c3give.com. We know you'll be blessed by your giving. Thanks again, church, and until next time, we'll see you soon.